the meeting with a call to order. Um, those present were all present, Sean, Chris, and I. Um, the third item on the agenda is just the approval of the minutes from June 15th. Approval. Second. All those in favor? And I think before um, we get into item four, I think the town manager has some information he'd like to share with us. So I'll turn the floor over to the, the town manager and yes. share the update with us. I know it breaks protocol, but I think it's important to use this opportunity uh, just to update you and the public um, uh, regarding the valuation and the expected tax rate for next year. Um, just by way of background, though the vote is scheduled for Tuesday, you may recall the council took action that authorizes us to actually commit taxes based on the budget that's passed and the one that's before the voters as we speak. As a practical matter, I don't think we'll actually commit the taxes till uh, probably Thursday next week, but given the fact that the vote is pending, it's, I think it's important to use this opportunity to um, advise on behalf of the assessor at this point uh, where things are shaking out. Essentially, uh, the assessor has set the, the, the rate. Um, well, I shouldn't say it hasn't set the rate, but it has set the valuation. And there are a couple of unique anomalies this year. Um, some could have been expected, others or others not, but we had an abnormally high amount of exemptions this year. So the net gain to our valuation was just over $9 million. And to those of you that have been following along, and many of you have, that's a almost an outrageously small number compared to what our historical increases year over year are. Uh, this year we had a total of over $53 million in exempt uh, in exemptions. What do we normally have? Uh, well, this is new exemptions. Um, so uh, part of what's in front of you there is the actual worksheet the assessor goes through to come up with uh, all of these calculations. Uh, but what made up that $53 million this year, uh, it's a combination of things, but the two largest items are, one, the state's decision to add an extra $5,000 of homestead exemption uh, for us for the 4,500 properties, a little more than that, that qualify, that's, uh, that's $24.2 million alone. Uh, beyond that, we had an abnormally high amount of Betty re, um, qualifications. This is the business equipment reimbursement program uh, through the state. Um, we had about 14.5 million in new Betty qualifications this year. Uh, the good news that means uh, our local businesses are investing them themselves, um, but it does present a challenge to us, and, and those are both uh, those, those values come directly off the top for us. There were some other adjustments uh, for Maine Health. Uh, this was something we anticipated coming. Uh, their, uh, some of their properties have become exempt given the nature of the tenants and, and use of those those properties. Uh, and then beyond that, there were a couple. Uh, there are a bunch of very smaller adjustments in a downward direction, totaling about $5 million across town. Uh, so you add all those up, it's a, it's a large number. Um, really, by happenstance and coincidence, uh, what that produces when you combine that with the budget approval is an expected tax rate of $16.49 per thousand. And coincidentally, that is the cautious estimate that we've been talking about. Uh, we got there in a totally different and circuitous way, mind you. But I guess if there's any silver lining, that's a number that's been part of the conversation throughout. It's certainly not news that I'm pleased to <coughs> present to you, but I think it's absolutely imperative given the timing of the vote. Um, and this information became available just late this afternoon, and this is just too good an opportunity to pass up, particularly with a holiday weekend staring at us. Um, again, I expect the actual commitment will occur uh, Thursday next week, and part of that I'd like to wait for after the um, executive session the council will have uh, next Wednesday evening. Uh, but that will still put us on a path to issue tax bills, give proper time for taxpayers to make payments at least 30 days, uh, and so we'll stay on schedule and avoid any cash flow issues at this point. So. Um, it's awkward for me to present this. This is the domain of the assessor, but again, I felt it was really important to uh, provide you at least a cursory overview this evening. What I provided is an updated tax rate comp sheet that reflects um, the new value and uh, the expected tax rate. And for what it's worth, although it's very hard to compare and understand it, uh, I've also attached the detailed worksheet that the assessor uses to um, get to that number. Um, I'm pleased to. I'll do my best to answer questions you may have.
the, just, just maybe just put clarity for those at home who probably don't have these sheets. So the the, the effective tax rate will be a 3.58 percent increase. Yes, I beg your pardon. And, yes, and we just we've been we've been using what 2.91. So it's a change. Well, uh, just to be fair, uh, we tried to be very careful in all the things we published from town hall. I guess with the exception of your board budget order, it did have 2.91. We tried to provide the yeah, range, yeah. which is the council's policy. Others have chosen to pick one number or another, and I'm not going to defend their choice. <coughs> You're correct. Uh, that would be a 3.58% increase over the current rate. But if anything, I think that this uh, shows that our methodology in um, establishing the ranges last year worked. Especially in an uncertainty, um, you know, the uncertain year that it is. So at least there's some credibility about how we derive that analysis, and that it, it obviously worked. I think statistically, it, it turned right. out, regardless of what the variables we use, right. statistically it seems to seems to be proving itself that the formula we're using is relatively accurate for that for that range. I'm certainly pleased. The policy has brackets of 50% and 150%, and we're right. we're at the 50% uh, this year for sure. So, Tom, uh, you, you mentioned the, the increases in Betty and Homestead. Um, can you speak a little bit to state reimbursement for those? Has that yes. changed? Uh, it's not changed. They're both reimbursed at 50%, um, but it's 50% of the taxes that you would have derived otherwise. And so uh, there's a bit of a glimmer of good news in that, in that those reimbursements have gone up. And for those paying attention, if you look at the last tax sheet, and I can provide it to you, the total net budget, um, that to be raised through taxation actually has gone down slightly because those reimbursements have gone up and those are dollar for dollar. So that's helped us uh, get to this point, frankly. Because mm -hmm. um, again, we have an anemic uh, $9 million increase in value, but it's a function of the other um, reimbursements that have helped keep it at this level. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I did make 10 copies, there's probably six or seven in the audience uh, collect you can distribute those if you like and I'm pleased to provide additional copies of well, just, just, just for clarity though too Tom are we allowed to put well I suppose it's public knowledge right there's no nothing against putting the assessor's calculation sheet up on the website at all or Not at okay. all. no and, and we've already started efforts I'll have a some sort of notice up on our website and availability of these documents I do expect the assessor will provide a detailed memo as they always do yep uh, but I think the, their preference would be to wait till after the point yeah. they're ready to commit. I was just so. going to ask if we could get clarification from the assessor first or descriptions before we just put the sheet up and let people kind of make their own conclusions from it, maybe a little guided. Yeah, I'm not sure if that's going to be, uh, it, uh, it's all public information. I don't sure. have a problem putting it up, but it, without being able to relate it to anything else, it's really hard to understand. Right. Um, I, I guess I provided just so you appreciate there is a detail process that's followed to get to this point. Yeah, I just want to make sure that there's it, information doesn't, I'm, I mean, I'm not suggesting we withhold any information, but if it goes out there without a description, I can see it creating some confusion out exactly. there and having people misunderstanding what's out there and creating more issues than we need to, so. I'll certainly have some commentary around it. Okay. Yes. Yeah, and, and talk, you speak, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm a little concerned because this, you know, I think for some, there is, there is going to be a surprise by this number and we're sitting here Thursday night, people are voting Tuesday, all the newspapers, the, the leader, the forecaster have already gone out. Can you speak a little bit about what kind of communication opportunities do we have to make sure when people do come to the polls on Tuesday, um, they're aware of this? So I, I, you've probably given that some thought, just wondering about, it, it sounds like we plan to put something on the town webpage. Do we plan to have anything available at the, at the voting? No, you can't. That's against uh, election laws. Uh, so it's, we're prohibited from having any collateral material uh, at the polls. Is there any other way to get the, the message out in the day we have? I mean, a lot of people leave for the holiday weekend. Sure. Uh, I'll, uh, we'll certainly use all of the town um, assets in that regard. I, I think I'll reach out to the communications committee of the council to see if there's any thoughts in that regard. I think you've got some access uh, in different areas of the community. So certainly the, wor the, the point of this at this late date is to get the word out as widely as we can, for sure. Can, can you also, just for public edification, um, maybe uh, discuss why the number came out now? Um, I know, again, I think some of the misconception might be we waited until the last minute or somebody waited until the last minute to get this out there. Um, can you address maybe the process a little bit of how 
why it took so why it's coming out now and it didn't come out a week or two or three weeks ago, let's say, for something like that? We're always, uh, this is the schedule we're typically on. It's maybe yep. uh, four or five days later this year. Okay. Uh, this year we've got some challenges. I've got an interim assessor who has had some extended time out of work with some medical leave yep. and a consultant that's done, I think, a yeoman's job to get us to this point. And I can assure you, even in the best of times with the most experienced assessors, Mr. Les Brons was here 30 years and Ruth was here, it's been here through all of them, it's always a trying time. And um, I should also mention, um, I was pleased to be part of some conversations only because they invited me in, but um, there's also some val uh, judgment calls that the assessor usually needs to make. And though there's some sales data that suggest, suggest that some values should be adjusted, um, there's, there was really a hesitancy, and I understand it, to make any major changes uh, in value. Um, as we consider, we're really on the doorstep of a revaluation. And so um, those are the sorts of conversations that happen before this number is finalized. Right. And frankly, I really wanted to scrutinize it. I, yep. I couldn't believe my eyes when I saw the number. So I've been pushing them to verify and re-verify. Um, I appreciate the perception, but I assure you we've We've been working tirelessly to get to this point. Well, and it, it's not unusual, I guess, what I'm, the point I'm trying to make is it's not unusual for this to come out now. In fact, typically it's well after the vote's taken anyway. So, Absolutely. you know, we, this is not information that we would normally have before we decided on a budget. This is something that comes well after that process typically. No, and, and frankly, the council's never involved in this level of discussion. Right. Usually people have their feet stuck in the sand at the beach, and the assessor always finalized the commitment <coughs> at the end of August and we advise you of tax rate and bills go out um, months after the council's concluded its budget deliberations, typically. Thank you. <coughs> Anything else? Anything? I think, uh, you know, hidden in the comment, um, or not hidden, but um, at the very end, it, this stresses why this community needs to have a complete reassessment performed. We do, and that's a, <coughs> a subject I'd love to um, get your, this committee's thoughts on how do we advance that. Um, out of budget cycle, or uh, we really need to be talking about it and get a plan. Kind of guess if it's okay with the rest of the community. I'd like to kind of break protocol a little bit. I think this is a, a key issue, and I think some of this audience has a way to get information out. Is, and does anybody need any questions? Have any questions for clarity on this item before we move on to the agenda? No, everybody okay? Well, uh, on the main health one. Can you at least have him go up to the podium? We are being taped. Yeah. Yeah, Larry, can you, I guess, go up to the podium? Yeah. Larry Hartwell, 9, Puritan Drive. Um, I, it's, uh, Tom has talked about the, uh, the valuation being computed towards the end of August, so that doesn't surprise me. I mean, you, you don't shoot the messenger. That was, that's something we've talked about, you folks have talked about for a couple of months, when that would come along. So that doesn't surprise me. Um, the main help one, I, I kind of wonder about that, because I don't know how all these assessments work, um, but they've got lots of buildings in town. I don't know what they put up new in the last year that would would all of a sudden become exempt that wasn't exempt last year. So that's my only question. Yeah, and I can speak to that. I wasn't directly involved in those discussions, but this is not new construction. It's existing space, as I understand it. The use of that space, the tenants, if you will, have changed over time. And those tenants now qualify for some of the one or more of the exempt um, statuses under, under main law. This is something that we're, we've been kind of negotiating and working with them uh, over a series series of years to get to this point. So this this does not come as a surprise. This is something we had full knowledge of. Uh, it frankly wasn't a big enough number under normal circumstances to uh, to really be an outlier. Uh, and I mentioned it just in the string of conversation around kind of the change agents happening this year. But this is not a surprise to us. And I assure you we've scrutinized and involved our town attorney as to whether or not these properties um, or portions of the properties are exempt, and, and believe they are. Uh, sir, that, that's determined by the state, though, correct? Or is that determined by? There's a local determination, but there's a state law that certainly gives guidance in terms of what's exempt, what has access to exempt status, and what doesn't. Okay. And our, is our 
uh, evaluation any different from the state's guidelines at all? Or, or no. do we pretty much follow the states and if they, if they meet the state criteria, then there isn't really much to talk about, right? There isn't much to talk about, but, right. but we do, particularly with this taxpayer, they, uh, they have large holdings in, in town and it's an annual occurrence to communicate with their folks, uh, facility and their finance folks to understand who the tenants are, whether there's any changes, and in this case, uh, some changes have necessitated uh, the exemption. I guess my point is it's not a subjective evaluation. It's, no. a, it's a very objective evaluation. No, and at the end of the day, we really don't have a, cha a, a right. choice. Okay. Um, we just need to make sure we verify. Yeah. Thank you. And if I'm correct, uh, this is something we've known for a while, but it's just um, it's, they actually agreed to not take it at the time that they originally requested and it was staged. This has been a, done over a right. three-year period. Right. This is the final, yeah. final piece, if you will. And that's in a way um, very uh, um, polite of them to allow that to happen because they could have asked for the entire exemption in the one right. year, which would have been a, a larger hit mm -hmm. all at once. And, mm -hmm. and that's what we why we negotiated it to help kind of ease it in. Mm -hmm. Anybody else? Any other questions? Okay. Thank you. Um, I think the, the item, the next agenda item was three. We had been talking about off and on about coming up with some metrics that we want to kind of use for a dashboard. And I think staff's been working on some great work on some graphs and some metrics to consider and they put together for us kind of a proposal. So I guess we did that. I'll turn it over for kind of an update and your thoughts and lead us through what you got, and if you will. Sure. So um, this is, most of this is just a review. Um, I'd like to remind you that the packets that you have that show the different graphs and the narrative that goes with those graphs, those are all um, based off of the last audited year's data, okay? So these are all coming off of 2015's audit. Um, I will certainly update them depending on what metrics you guys make a final decision on with the audited data that we have as soon as the 17 audit is complete. Um, but when I presented at the last meeting the graph, this kind of um, shortened version of the graph, um, that my intent was not that that would be your quote dashboard unquote, but rather that those would be an ex um, for you to see what metrics I was recommending and for you to give a yes or no to. This is more of the dashboard that I would like to kind of see being <coughs> um, So on this dashboard, I have some metrics. You'll, the metrics that are represented on this dashboard, the data for them is coming off of the two pages of graphs that you have attached to it. So I guess what I'm looking for for feedback from, from um, the Finance Committee is do you agree that these are the metrics you would like to see year over year be displayed in, as soon as we have audited data to update? And if not, what do you feel is missing or what do you feel is unnecessary? And I guess the, the follow-up is, does this dashboard display, does that do what you're intending, or can we modify that somehow? So our recommendations really hasn't changed. These are the yep. five yep. Uh, metrics that we recommend that we think are important and, uh, and have suggested a way to look at them quickly. The only one that has, is not present on there that I recommended last time and I still think is a good idea, but really is only something that we can measure every five years at most and really best every 10 is the um, debt per capita as a percent of per Absolutely capita no. income and watching how that trends. That's a really a long range metric. We can't do that year over year. We can only do it when we have solid census data. Um, currently we have um, American Community Survey data which is a branch of the U.S. Census on the five to go with our decennial census numbers. And as soon as 2020 census comes out, the town of Scarborough will have tapped 20,000, which will make ACS data available every three years. So it will, um, but a reminder that the ACS data is a sample size. It's statistically relevant. We can use it to some extent, but it is not the same as a decennial, um, very thorough, complete census that is done. So that would be the only metric I would really recommend be continue to be considered, even on a long range sort of thought pattern, um, it is a very clear, I, I believe it to be a clear indicator of ability to pay over time. So when you're taking the, per, as far as like the impact of debt service and looking at it in terms of where people <coughs> are over time. So that's per capita, the debt per capita as a percentage of per capita income. 
um, is just, it's, I've taken it off from the last time that we met, only because it's something that is not a year-over-year -year mark, but something I would recommend continue to be looked at every five years at least. Can, can we go back? I, there's actually, it's not around debt management policy and the, some of the metrics they have. I know we've talked about it, but um, why isn't debt, why did we consider not putting just debt per capita on here? So we have debt per capita in our debt management policy. Yep. That is something that we do by policy track already. Yep. Um, we certainly to? can put debt per capita on here if that is something <coughs> that you would like to see. Um, oh, actually, I have put it on here. Sorry. The bottom one. So I've, I've included this bottom one. I'm sorry. That is, oh, just as a reminder, I guess I, it's a, every five years mark. Oh, yeah, but, oh, okay. I'm but, gonna, okay. I'm but debt per capita, we absolutely can put on here. Um, it is something that we calculate, though, for you already as part of the debt management policy. You should have in your packet. Yeah, I saw that. This sheet. But I think just, just as a dashboard, especially if we're going to share it with our public. At least I, would, I wouldn't mind seeing debt per capita. So I, that, yeah. we have it as a percentage of income. Do, would you like it presented in a different form? Well, if I recall through this information, um, there was a question about do we do debt per valuation because of the commercial impact or do we do debt per capita, which is, which is maybe a little bit, I don't want to say misleading, but not entirely accurate because it doesn't take into account the commercial aspect of the town. Is that correct? We had talked about that. So you do have on your dashboard debt, uh, total debt as a percentage of full state valuation. You can see right. that's at 2.53 as of 2000, June 30, 2016. Mm -hmm. We had talked about because population data is not something that we can gather um, really concretely every year. That is something we need to wait for census for. And because we think that between 18 and 20 percent of our total value is captured by our business community, that to do debt per capita is perhaps for a community with the style of base that Scarborough has is not the best and clearest mm -hmm. representation of comparing our debt load to other communities, if that's the purpose of the exercise. Um, and that debt per value is a better apples to apples comparison. Um, for us to be able to compare to communities that may have um, far smaller business communities that are sharing in their debt burden. Um, so, but there's space. I mean, this is, but I certainly have space for another box. If we want to include both, we can. Yeah, I, I guess, I guess, I'm, I guess what I'm trying to get at is, I, I mean, I'd like to know what we're trying to accomplish with these metrics. Are we trying to do comparisons with other communities to see how we're, how we're performing uh, you know, in relation to them, are we trying to do just a snapshot internally of our own metrics as they relate to bond agency requirements, or are we just looking for, uh, you know, a, a number that we want to trend and track for whatever reason we want to track it for? So it strikes me that if we, if we include both total debt as a percent of state valuation and total debt per capita, that could be kind of conflicting in one way or another because you look at one's trending positively and one's neutral. So that kind of leads me as how does that impact our debt policy? Because they're, they're not necessarily conflicting, but which data do we want to use and why, I guess, is the question I'd like to establish for that. And if I may just want, as a word of caution, the total debt number is something that we have concretely. I can, I can use audited data and be really confident about that. If you do decide to pursue debt per capita as something that we're looking at year over year, then I would also ask for some real clear guidance about how you wish to use population. Because if you wish to use the last census data population by the time that you get nine years out, it's a really false figure. And so you'd have to agree on how are you forecasting population for as you get further and further away from census. I'm not saying that it shouldn't be done. I just want as a word of caution that it's another complication of using anything per capita is that we don't necessarily have the data that is going to make that as good a metric as some other options might be. So one way to capture it might be if you wanted to capture that kind of household piece, we could do it as debt per number of households. If there was some interest in capturing how does this affect, how does this fluctuate with the increase of residents in the community, that would be one way to maybe think of that is in terms of dwelling units. Um, it's still something you'd be able to compare with other communities, but it would not rely on outside data collection from census in order to have a solid number. So which uh, of these two indicators, the total debt as a percentage of full valuation and total debt per capita as a percent of per capita income, um, which, let's say, would a, what, would, would a rating organization use one versus the other? I think they would use both. They would use both. I think they would, I, from what I understand, that they would both be 
something that depending on which bond agency you yeah. are, you would be looking at. Yeah, the different but, but agencies but, but, value different things, but mm -hmm. uh, they're both important, I suspect. But, but for me, I think the debt per capita is I look at some of these policy that seems to be a standard, that seems to be something some of our constituents are focused on, and Cabot and Moore actually use that as one of the benchmarks they do share with us as having other benchmarks. I mean, it, we don't have to have the perfect matrix. What we're trying to do is just answer your question, Chris. I think where we got to is this isn't necessarily to benchmark against all other communities because all other communities are doing different things. I think what we were trying to do is find, as these arrows indicate, which way are we going? What, what is our sort of general direction? Are our ratios improving? Are our ratios not improving? And then we can dive into those numbers and maybe do some benchmarking with other communities. But I think, I think we decided what we wanted to do is what are the things that we want to monitor for our town, for our situation, to keep a pulse on where we're going? I think that's where we got to. At least that's where I understood we got to. I'm not sure if that's what both of you thought we got to. Um, yeah, my just my concern would again be what what's the data going to be used for? And and to staff's point, uh, if as we you know it might be a great metric this year, but as we get farther away, you know we have to and, and this body is going to change over time. Yeah. You know whatever we put in here should be something that's 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 transferable and and kind of broad and trending purposes. So as we get out, if this if this debt per capita, I, I'm not saying that we don't use it, I'm just saying if it becomes inaccurate over time, you know, we might know this now in three to four years or five years, who's to say the finance committee is going to recognize that? So why would we build that in ahead of time if that's an inherent flaw with that particular metric? Well, you know I, what I'm saying? I mean, my guess is if you went down through each one of these metrics, we could find flaws in them. I think, I think the intent was this was a putting our toes in the water or trying to find a dashboard that we could use. I fully expect, just like every other policy and thing we do, it will be tweaked over time. It should be tweaked over time. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's not going to be etched in stone forever. The world changes. So, I mean, I, I think we should go into it with an expectation that this isn't going to be perfect. We're, gonna, we're trying to respond to some things our constituents are asking. At the start, I would fully expect every finance committee maybe look at it every year. And said, is this is this helpful? Is this not helpful? Do we need to make a tweak? I guess that's where I'd be. But this isn't. So we, I mean, we, perfect sometimes can be the enemy of, of doing something good. No, I understand that. But if we're going to trend it over time and we're going to tweak it every year, I don't, I don't know what the purpose. I, mean, well, I guess I don't know. What, uh, I view this as just kind of indicators. These are right. things that this group uh, and staff has said that these are important things that we want to pay attention to, yeah. and. Uh, based on the trending, it will require a deeper dive. Right. Um, what's going on? Why are we moving? And we might be able and be comfortable with the explanation, but it's just kind of waving the flag. Right. This is something we want to dig deeper in. Yeah. And it, it may take us in the direction of a comparative analysis, or it may require us to bring in consultants to help us understand what's, what the dynamics are. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, again, my, my concern would only be that, that it, it, if without without a lot of explanation in it or without some kind of explanation, anybody can take this sheet and interpret their own, get their own take from it, whatever trending it is. So I guess maybe uh, would it be possible or, or could we put something in there like a, a parameter? So let's use the top one, debt service percentage of annual revenue. Annual revenue. Is there a range that we should be looking at? And well, I, think, I think we asked that last time. Yeah. But to give like a gauge. Of right. And almost even put that on the sheet to say between if it's 10 to 12, let's say, I don't know if that's the right number, but we're in that range yeah. or we're outside of that range. And then, but with that range, mm. where that range comes from and why. You know, it's a, it's a, it's a bond rating issue. So that's why we yeah. chose that range. Yeah. You, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. yeah. Um, couple of things, a lot of questions um, and comments. So first, uh, um, to Chris's question about what do we want from this and how, because um, then it, that should lead to how we use it. Um, from a presentation perspective, I think this is an incredible step forward for us and the executive piece on the top piece is exactly where I'm looking at. I agree, we need to have some type of benchmark within each of the categories that says why is that green arrow positive? But some people are going to say, well, but the arrow's pointing down. Right? Yep. So you need to have some type of going down, right? right? That's a positive. So, yeah, that's going down. Explain that. so yeah, the direction yeah. of the arrow indicates well, I mean, the way that it's going, and right. green is good, yellow is, hey, just But some watch. people, when they look at that, non-financial people are going to sit there and not understand that. So I think that you need to have 
um, the, the benchmark, and the benchmark really should be what is our policy because while this is great to report on, what really needs to happen is that this piece needs to reflect what we have in our policy um, so that we're looking at that on an annual basis and we know where we are. And maybe on this, um, on this top piece, um, there's three, three out of five items are debt related. Debt isn't the only focus that we should be looking at in the community. Um, we should, you know, I mean, debt's, I mean, sorry, um, fund balance is in there. Um, there's other things that we should be looking at. Um, I think it's interesting that we have the qualified applicants for the tax assistance program. Um, some may have a philosophical difference in believing that increased number of applicants is a negative trend rather than maybe positive because we're providing assistance. So uh, we need to kind of look in comparison to this. We need to look at our debt policy, um, all of our policies because fund balance is not in debt management. Um, there's other policies that we also measure too and that really this summary should encapsulate all of the measures and then provide maybe a three-year on the executive level, a three-year. If you, I, I agree with um, Chris. I don't. I do not support having as a, a overall policy, um, or even as one of our primary focuses a, a, on a per capita basis, or anything on a per capita basis. Because um, whether it's revenues, whether it's expenses, whether it's programs, it goes across the board, and it's influenced heavily by the business community that we have, and we're lucky to have here. So I think it's something to, good to have as a substantive piece underneath with the rest of the chart, which I think we have in here. Um, so yes, that's nice to keep track of because people do look at it. Whether or not we focus at this particular level is one that I probably would not go down unless you're comparing it to something else of a similar metric. When you compare two metrics together. But so debt per capita is in the policy. Is in your debt right. management policy. Is in the debt management policy. I need a new, yep. So that, that would be one where you, right. you, you just said it should it should include the thing. Oh, but so is in debt as a percent of statutory debt limit, but that's not on the sheet here. Well, I know, but I think so, your, your yeah. point was whatever's in the policy right. should be part of the. Okay, yes. Yeah. I, well, I, I'm, I'm not saying, saying that the policy is correct either, by the way. <laughs> right, we got to get there. Right, we got to get there. That's the next right. step. But. Well, but. remember, uh, debt seems to be the focal point, but this was intended to be a, kind of a wider picture. Yeah. Right. The debt being just a part of that and right. actually the dominant part, but there's other pieces too. So. Right. Um, we did provide reporting uh, as regards to the metrics that, that are identified in the debt policy mm -hmm. on a separate sheet, yep. and that's a point of discussion we'd like to say, are those the right metrics that we should be measuring debt by? Um, incidentally, Peter, we did model this policy that's in place directly after that GFOA policy. We yeah. tweaked it for some yeah. local yeah. use, yeah. Uh, but you'll see great commonalities between yeah. the two. And Tom, if, yeah. I may, if I may quickly, as to the ranges, um, you guys did ask for that at our last meeting, and when I started looking at the ranges from the bond agencies, they were so wide yeah. that I thought it would be more productive to once you guys had established which metrics you wanted to chart, and hopefully they would be informing policy. Once there's a range that you have set as policy, like let's say that you, you guys set as policy, yeah. debt service as a percentage of annual revenues should be between 8 and 13 percent, or whatever number yeah. you guys choose. At that point, those ranges, I think, are more informative than the very broad ranges that the debt that bonding agencies give, rep understanding that different communities are built so differently. So the, sure. so the ranges for some of them may have 10 percentage point ranges, whereas for this community, that would be not helpful. So I thought that it would be, um, so I, I, I did not ignore your, your ask for last time. Um, when I went to go calculate, calculate them and put them in, they just were not helpful. Okay. Everything was within range. Right. We are well within every bond rating agency's comfort zone. Um, so there was nothing that it was going to add as far as any warning signs for us. Um, but it, it just seems it would be more productive to once policy has been informed by the, the metric choices that you guys make, that then those ranges can be established based on your new, perhaps, debt management policy metric, yep. Yep. and they can be reflected yep. in the dashboard. So, so I would suggest that we collectively decide which, which, I, I'd ra you know, rather than having three of the five categories be debt, let's pick one, decide on it, and and debate why that's the right one, and put that on the metric for the higher for the higher picture, and then and look at some other drivers. I'm not sure what they are off the top of my head now, but there could be something related to. Uh, it could be a you know, percentage of, of uh, spending for municipal side and school side and how that varies. I mean, there's all kinds of different uh, uh, metrics that we could use. So I just, having three, three issues, three parameters on here for debt service, I, I think, uh, you know, maybe to Tom's point is it's, it's really heavily leaning towards that. So 
I guess I'd, I'd suggest we pick one. Or, or maybe a or counter suggestion would be, and I think Sean makes a great point, the other thing that's on the policy is to work on a debt management policy. Mm -hmm. And there's some metrics in there, so if, if what we may want to do is make sure we've got the right metrics we want in the debt policy. Right. And then and then come back to this and then edit this to reflect. We need, to talk about, we need to talk about the policy. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Yeah, so. uh, right. Yeah, right. I, 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 right, and I think we should let's maybe have, you know, have a have the uh, one, two, three, four. I like the I like the layout. I like the presentation. Yeah. Yeah. You know, maybe we have five uh, five subjects. One of them's debt. What parameter yeah. do you want to answer that? Yeah. One of them might be I income. What yeah. what is it? Is it fees versus tax or something? You know, I mean, come up with those five criteria of what we're going to snapshot so it's not heavily debt yeah. dependent. Yeah. I mean, a couple other ones, I mean, you know, you asked about others that I'd written down, which I think is important, is you had one in here, one of the charts on what's happening to median income and our ability to pay. That was kind of an interesting statistic that, you know, that might be helpful to have as a metric. The other one I wondered about was, another one is what are our revenues as a percent of our valuation? You have that on yeah, this? on another. Um, no, you've got oh, right okay. here on this side of the chart. So. Um, these ones I tracked as far as like increases yes. and with arrows, but then just to show you another format that we can use, this shows these two bar, two graphs show the same information. One of it, sh one of them shows it over a five-year period, so you can see long-range trends, and one of them shows it as just for fiscal year at the end of fiscal year 16. So that shows um, general fund expenditures as a percent of town assessed value, non-property oh, tax I revenue, and property tax revenue. Okay. Um, and they're all bold because they're all areas where we can see that the lines are trending in a direction slightly that we might perceive right. as a warning sign of we wouldn't want to see a steep incline on those lines. Um, but we don't have any kind of guidelines yet, so I would not call them good, bad, or, or warning. They're just, so I've made them gold, subtly shaded. I'm sorry <laughs> about uh, the subtle shading, but um, that's how they look. So you do have a total of eight different things being yeah. tracked on this sheet, yeah. okay. and you can just decide how you how you like them to be represented to you. If you like bar graphs with the ability to look at things over time, or if you like the snapshot of just that year. Okay. So I hope so. So I hope the next move is that we look at a fiscal policy for the town that has a debt management component that has the fund balance, and we've already had it kind of. Um, because it needs to, it needs a little bit of restructuring because fiscal policy should cover everything, and then debt management is one part, general fund is the other part, then there's some other categories. Mm -hmm. um, but um, I hope that we get into this debt management. The question I have is, um, um, do we have any? Um, could we get? Um, how does our current policy compare to others, and um, or other standards, or other? representations of a debt management policy, and are there any gaps? I'm not sure if we're prepared to answer that, how it compares oh, to thinking, others, yeah, yeah. Uh, but I, I do know that you know, this policy is not terribly old, and it was based uh, based on a model policy from arguably the, the, uh, the authority in government finance uh, accounting, GFOA, so um, we can do some analysis to see what other people have. I think it's interesting that town has only had a debt management policy for five years. I think also as far as comparison, if I may, it's your debt management policy, a lot of your metrics are actually far more stringent um, than the state guidelines. So the, on that sheet that you have as a printout, one way to, if you wish to compare what this, so the state allows a certain level of debt in each of the debt categories, and the debt management policy has assigned what the town of Scarborough allows, and in every case, the town of Scarborough allows a significantly lower percentage of debt um, as a percentage of your total state valuation than the state statute allows. So that is one, if you, that's one comparison we do have, that the state says that, for instance, we can have a total of 15% of our uh, total assessed value held in debt, and our debt management policy says, no, you can only have 8.5. So that's one, one comparison we do have, is that already the town of Scarborough has adopted a much more conservative debt management policy than the state statute would allow. So I guess maybe we could discuss what, what we want to use for guidelines. Do we want to go with state levels? Do we want to go with bond rating levels? Do, I mean, what's the outcome we want from this? If we, if we I, I think the, the staff point, if we go with the state, it's a pretty broad range and pretty wide. Um, and so, I mean, it's like 
you know, hitting the side of a barn with a handful of rice. You're going to hit it no matter what. Um, do we want to look at a specific bond rate or a specific requirement that's maybe a little bit more stringent and say this is why we're using this criteria? I mean, I think, I think it's to Sean's point. Sean, your, your point was trying to combine the debt with a reserve policy all into one is what your thought yeah, is? Yes. So, so um, the way that the uh, our uh, it's it's purely struck it's uh, it's the uh, um, ADHD in me and yeah. what it is this policy says it's debt management and fiscal policy, but yet it doesn't include anything about fund management. That's in a separate policy. So to me, there's one fiscal policy and then you have parts or components of that. In that, you have a debt management one. You'll have the fund balance and you combine them into one fiscal policy. So it's purely a structural how you catalog, it. Uh, catalog it that type of piece. But I think that what we need to do is that we need to go through this policy, um, look at how it is structured, um, and then compare it to what we think we want for measures and where it is mentioned in here around that policy. Then we put in the benchmark um, and or the policy level that we want, and then we measure it, and then you back, basically back report it back. Yep. Right. You report it backwards through this document. Yeah, I, and I just I, again, I just wanted to, to say whatever we put in here for ranges, let's have a discussion of why we're using those ranges and where they come from. Right. Whether it's debt, uh, yeah. whether it's bonding rate uh -huh. agency or state, or yeah. or and then discuss what the pros and cons of each one of them are, because you know there's it depends on what we want to accomplish with the debt policy. Do we want to? It depends on what we want to accomplish with it. You know. The, uh, the single sheet that was attached with the policy uh, does two things. One, it reports what has already been established as currently our local debt limits, which, as Larissa said, are significantly less than state. And then uh, more to the point of the discussion tonight, um, looking at Appendix 1, there are four metrics that this policy calls out. So that might be a good place for you to focus. Are those the right ones? Right. And we have calculated those just so you know where we stand right now. But more fundamentally, the question is, are those the right metrics for debt? And again, the, the four that are called out are sort of, that those seem to be standard among different municipalities. So that, that would be something that's easier to benchmark down the road as a consideration. So how do we want to go about your suggestion, Sean, about doing the debt? Should we table that to next time so we have a chance to go through the debt policy? And uh, we're not going to be able to accomplish that tonight. I think. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I think that we all need to take a crack at it. Um, if we can get this in a Word document so that we can share. I'll give a PDF so you don't change it on me. <laughs> well, we're going to change it on you anyway. The question is, do we do it and ask you to do it, or do we just do it? <laughs> of course. Do we of course do it with you or without you? We'll right, share it. Right, no, right. we have that Google Share thing, so everybody can track. Um, I, yeah, I, put it on SharePoint. I do need training. I'm right. impressed. Yeah, sure. We'll, we'll share. We'll share that. We'll, yeah. You know, and then we can all take a, a kind of a shot at it. Pull it together. Um, yeah. Yeah. Or... Or we could ask staff if they um, would be kind enough to go through, do the evaluation regarding any gaps um, and making any uh, recommendations structurally as far as indexing, you know, whatever. Um, and then we can go from there. That way we're, we're using their recommendation to build on it. I'm just hesitant to ask them to do something and then have us go, yeah, we were actually thinking about something else. So I, I, I can go either way. But it, I, it does work best if you give us basic yeah. policy guidance. We can do the drafting and bring it back right. to you. But, yeah. um, and I'm comfortable uh, with that. Because yeah. yeah. we have to do something. We have to move right. this forward. Yeah. Right. Right. Uh, I know, Sean, you articulated a, a, your interest in having an, uh, an overall fiscal policy with a debt component and a fund balance component. Is that something that the committee would like to see? We can, we can work as well on As well as any other policies that are in the, you know, in that, I mean, they're all sure. separate um, ordinances sure. or separate yeah, policies. They really should be one fiscal policy, and then these are just subsets. Yeah, we have a capital budgeting policy that right. many of you yep. get they around. Capital still need some work, but that right. could so be a capital. There's a purchasing policy. Purchasing capital and capital. When we did the capital policy, we refer back to debt. In the capital, yep. in the debt policy, we refer to capital. But they're not all in one place. They, in so. essence, become chapters within the full fiscal policy mm -hmm. document. Is that something you'd like us to take a crack at? Coming back like with a combined yeah. single yeah. single document. Yeah. Yeah. Right. So with that, the next agenda item was to at least start the conversation around financial modeling, what we might be able to do, what's possible. Um, again, that's been something we've talked about for a while now and trying to figure out, and I think now especially 
with the news of tonight and where we're going to be going down the road and especially with some of the things that we're planning with the facilities plan and other things. Um, is it possible, or maybe just this kind of the exploratory conversation of can we start to look at just kind of a rough two to three year projection of what the numbers might look like? Um, you know, I, th I think that's, I mean, there's a lot of variables, but in some ways the, the town is, you know, historically has come in right about the two to three percent increase. Um, the schools, you know, a significant portion of their costs are, are fixed costs with labor contracts, which are known. So I think, I think the concept becomes people really are starting to want us to kind of look ahead and see what's coming. I mean, certainly as we've gone through minimum receivership and other things, <coughs> is there a way we can start getting a picture of that? What sort of the pros and cons? What sort of the barriers of doing that? I, tonight was just kind of to explore that conversation about what we can do. It, so it starts as sort of just a planning tool. It doesn't have to be perfect, but at least it gives us a landscape of what we might be thinking about and what's coming and do some proactive planning rather than trying to do it all during the budget season. So I guess I kind of turn that over to you, Tom, about is it possible? I, I guess I have some thoughts off the top, and I'm yeah. certainly pleased to get more. Uh, it, it's certainly possible, but I, I do fear that there would, uh, there would be a, a number of very important assumptions that would need to be made. And depending on where those assumptions land, um, the outcome is likely to be very different. So I, I guess I'd ask a more fundamental question. To what end? I don't disagree at all that we should be eyes wide open anticipating things coming at us and planning accordingly. But I wonder what the result of putting pen to paper and, and numbers on the paper that, um, that I'm going to have a hard time having much confidence in. And I guess the only way to have confidence is to be very conservative and that's going to produce some scary numbers based on that analysis. Um, and I just wonder what purpose will that serve us? So I, I, I'm, not, I'm not saying no, I'm just putting it out there and really wondering out loud what will the product of that effort be. So I guess, I mean, if I could, um, I mean, obviously um, the, you know, the concerns around the school portion of the budget are beyond our purview. I think what we could do is come up with a, uh, a model of some type uh, and then present that at joint finance perhaps and say, listen, this is what we're doing. We'd love it if you guys came aboard and tried to match up so that we could do some, mm -hmm. some better planning or, you know, maybe give us some numbers to plug in to a, a system or something. I, I, I think we, and correct me if I'm wrong, Ruth, I believe we, 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 we have a pretty decent understanding from from a general um, cost perspective where our trends are over a certain portion of the budget. I mean, we can't get down finite, but we can kind of track things historically of, you know, uh, uh, sure. increases and things like that. I wonder if it's good to just start with that as a basis and maybe not try and capture everything oh, and yeah. say what, what are the things that we can look at and, and try and trend over time to say, you know, these are historically trending in this percentage or, or something and we can look at that and go, okay, we at least get some of it in, in, in I think play. The expense side is, uh, I'm far more comfortable, at least on the municipal side, mm -hmm. uh, forecasting that in the future. It's kind of all the external forces that concern me. Um, you know, I, I'd have a lot more comfort if we did it on kind of a biennial state budget, that we have a little more certainty. Uh, but I we've just that. learned that right. all of a sudden, you know, we get handed a uh, things from Augusta that we have to deal with that we couldn't possibly have anticipated. Homestead exemption being an example. Right. Especially since the homestead exemption bill that we knew was coming down was supposed to then start reimbursing municipalities at 62.5%. Right. And it was amended at the last moment to still stay at the 50. So that $5,000 increase in homestead wouldn't have been felt if it had also increased the reimbursement by that up to 62.5. And we can't model for that. Right. Well, and, yeah. that's what I was alluding to with the, with the state funding. But, but I think on the expense side, I think we can do it with some degree of comfort or confidence, I don't know how you want to characterize that. Yeah, I mean, I, it, to, to me that would be a, a decent start. I mean, I think, uh, I, the, I mean, the revenue stream is, I mean, it is the wild card for us. It, it's somewhat of a wild card, but it's, I mean, it, it, I mean, I, I think going back up, so to answer mm -hmm. your question, we started from when we started the other conversation, what's the intent? Mm -hmm. So I think the intent is for us to start looking, in the past we said, well, geez, we don't know what next year is going to bring. Mm -hmm. 
this will just say, starts putting it on paper in front of us so we can start thinking about what does the next couple of years look like. And is there some ways, and you're right, it's not going to be perfect, but every business that I've ever been associated with in government is different than business. But most entities have to do some forward planning and some strategic planning. And certainly for us, with the world we're facing, no, next year is probably going to be a really challenging budget year, I would suspect, <laughs> unless some things change. And already there are starting to be numbers floated around about what next year is going to be. I would rather us somewhat in front of it, looking at it, at least at one point, the Joint Finance Committee said they might be interested in starting doing some preliminary work around those things to say, are oh, there some things we can start thinking about? So for me, it's more of, at least it will directionally tell us where we're going. And if there, if there are things we can do proactively, shouldn't we start those conversations as soon as we can? So it doesn't have to be perfect. Again, right, I think sure. it's, it's much more like the metric. It's it puts at least put something on paper so we can start thinking about ah okay and I, and and I think to your point and we've talked about this in the past too I think we do that to some extent already I mean one of the crap one of the charts was the uh, percentage of uh, the percentage change from previous year for the for the tax rate year over year and and we've got that ten years worth of data we can average that out and look at an average of three point three four percent over the year annually for 10 years. I mean, there were years that were seven, there were some that were zero. But we know, and that's kind of where we landed on that 3% number. It wasn't an arbitrary number that we put in front of the council and right, said, right. we just want it, we like that number. It's, it was through this analysis that we said, we're anticipating about a 3% tax increase. And we build that into our projections when we do our planning. So I, I think from that macro level, we're kind of already doing that to some extent. It's the, it's the intangibles and the reactionary stuff that we have to go to. And even with the biennial budget, there's no guarantee next year's budget's going to be the same. They can come back and tweak things and adjust things, and they do quite frequently on the school side of things. Yeah. So I, I, so I, I mean, I, like to your point, you know, when is good good enough? Um, do we just utilize the existing trending information and say, we know it's going to be about in here, so 3% is for our projections or for our, for our calculations is the right number from a revenue perspective or for, from, a, from a tax base standpoint, and then start backing into things like uh, programming if we, you know, when's the right time to, to retire certain debt or, you know, expand a program or do something like that. Well, I, I think the purpose of it becomes, so if, if you know, I think it's a subject for another day, whether 3% is still the right number, that's decided every year by, mm -hmm. by the council and right. when they come in and goals, and maybe that's the right number, maybe it's not. But isn't that, isn't that what we're, what we're trying to accomplish with some long-range projection? No, 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 but I think it, it's more of saying, okay, let's just take the 3%. Mm -hmm. I mean, if that's where we know tax revenue can increase to mm -hmm. on the valuation, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. then if we know what our expenditures are, mm -hmm. then we'll have a good shot of knowing, okay, will 3% cover the expenditures or are we going to have, you know, a situation mm -hmm. where expenditures are going to far exceed that targeted rate Mm -hmm. And we're going to have to do something. Right, but don't and we? I mean, can we do that right now with what we have now, I without developing something new? It seems to me the intent of the, uh, and I think it's three years now. You've had this three percent target. It was really to provide telegraph to the community that, regardless of what comes our way, we're going to give you the predictability, stability, and hopefully sustainability. And you may be right; three percent may not be sustainable to some, and it may need to be revisited. But the intent of that, I always believed, is that. We're telling everyone that regardless of the hand we're dealt, we're going to do our very best to right. meet this benchmark. Uh, this year, it looks like we're slightly above it, but uh, the last three years, we've been 2.53, so we've been comfortably below it. Right. Um, but I think to your point, we can... Sorry. You, you, yeah. So um, I agree that we should um, have forecasting, but I think it should mirror that to the state's budget uh, or the cycle uh, the, on a two-year basis. Because there are some knowns. Yes, it can change, but we at least know today what was approved and where we are. Because, I mean, right, a uh, financial statement is nothing more than a snapshot in time. It is, it's not static and it doesn't change once it's been an analyzed um, until the next time that you take a, um, an assessment of that. So I think it needs to be on a two year cycle or some, some variation of that. Um, I agree with Tom, and that is, it, I think that we have to look at why we're doing it and what we're going to use it for. So, um, and I want to use it, um, and I think that the fact that staff has a high degree of confidence in at least starting us at um, the operating expense side 
as long as um, the school department has the same level of confidence, then I think that's a great place to start. So long as we're using it to talk about where our investments are going and how we want to increase added value in our community and what those programs and how they're being supported. If it's purely for the sole purpose of debating about the tax rate, um, I think that needs to be part of a policy uh, conversation such that, you know, whether or not 3% is still accurate, what we can do is we could create a policy that says, using the data and the approach that we've done with every other thing, we will, we will um, the council will establish a tax rate equivalent to the 10-year average. And that becomes an automatic. I guarantee I don't want to bind any future council because that's why they're elected. But at least it becomes a policy that is a benchmark on which they can then have a conversation. Um, and, and whether it's a five-year average, ten-year average, whatever it might be, but there has to be that conversation about the investments and what we're invest why we are investing them, um, and then talk about the impact of those investments when we then look at what is the debt requirement, what is the tax rate requirement, and how that kind of drives. And, and in essence, and by the way, when you do that, you then have to balance those expenditures and how you're going to fund it with the debt management policy, uh, with an overall fiscal policy, and every other component that's in that. So um, it's going to be a very large exercise. I just think that we need to take it one step at a time and let's start with the expenses since there's a high level of confidence and we can build on that. Well, well could, we, could we even use the, the, uh, the, the, for lack of a better word, the Rowan formula um, that we're using for valuation and plug that in on the tax rate and say it, we're the range of, you know, we're not going to set the tax rate for future councils, but we'll say it's, a, it's the 10-year average plus 50%, minus 50%, that's what you should be using as a benchmark kind of thing. I mean, could we do something like that, or? You see what I'm saying? To get started, I think so, because yeah. then the, the secondary question of that is that um, um, some in the community aren't comfortable looking at it just from a total tax rate. Right. They're now looking at it from a total spending. So we have to address whether or not that becomes a new policy. Um, rather than just the tax piece. So I think you need to balance the two. To me, I'm comfortable in starting at that point because it's known to us. Mm -hmm. um, but then we need to look at, you know, what is the impact of just doing it from that approach? And we may need to change the analysis to do it from a total spending. So, so you're comfortable, as Thomas just said, at least the first pass starting with expenditure? Absolutely. Okay. So let's, Absolutely. Is that something? We, oh, sorry. I just had a question. So when we, if we prepare like a two-year scenario, do we base it just on uh, <coughs> current expectations, current expenditures? Do you want to build in increases in staffing or in, uh, if we were doing the school, maybe programs? Or do we just base it on current current spending? Well, I don't think it's so much good because it seems to me that there'll, there'll need to be future investment, mm -hmm. um, not just the status quo. And that's going to be part of the challenges anticipating when that's needed. Right. And part of the value, I suspect, of the exercise is mm -hmm. to Say we need to expand prior personnel, and this is how the cycle of that investment is going to be made. I mean, it may take it may take some challenges, but I mean, I know like the fire department has a staffing plan. You know, I would assume Chief Moulton has a similar staffing plan. You know, do we roll that in at some point and say if we follow that staffing plan and we couple that with capital replacement for equipment, sure. what does that look like? You know, uh, yeah, I and think we could cobble together <coughs> something based on a lot of different inputs, and yeah. it will be imperfect, but it right. will be uh, just start to something just, just to say talk about. Where are we? And what, are, what are the gross expenditures look like? And what does that mean? <coughs> right. As far as where um, the monies are allocated within the budget, outside of the general policies that the council approves, it's really it states in the charter, um, and we don't necessarily do it exactly as charter. It says that the town manager will determine where those funds are allocated. We simply approve how much funding he receives because it's his job and why he's paid the big bucks um, to be able to make those determinations. A good manager, though, just isn't going to simply go out and just do what he wants. He's going to give the input of the council, um, and that's what has always happened here. But technically speaking, he has the authority to direct which investments are prioritized first. So I would rely on the manager's recommendation on those priorities. And maybe as part of the budget, we also provide the priorities in each and within any category that the manager recommends. Well, yeah. we, we, he presents the budget. Those are his. We assume right. those are his recommendations to begin with, and then we modify it from there. Right. right. The, the charter is clear in that regard. I'm tasked with presenting a budget. Presumably, that's my yeah. host of recommendations in terms of where we, uh, we should invest and how much we should invest and where. And then you can do with it what you will. Yeah. And then you give it back to me to administer it. Right. 
So, so uh, as a conclusion, this may maybe how long how long would it take to kind of get just a rough sort of pass of looking forward? How far do you want to look? I mean, I, I two years. Yeah. Nineteen and twenty. Fiscal nineteen. Fiscal twenty. Well, okay, in three months we're starting the uh, we're starting the budget process and yeah. anyway. is it three, three less four? than three now well, but, yeah. but but the time will be that at least it'll give us a heads up yeah. maybe of things look good or things you know this this will be something we need to look at so yeah. well, well, well work in progress keep, keep in mind I mean not to be uh, pessimistic or uh, um, in three months or two months whatever the time frame is there could be three new town councilors and two of us could be gone off the finance committee and the new town council could give completely different direction. I would hope not, but well, if we do 1920, at least just year 20 will be the first year of a new biennium. So we'll have to make some assumptions and just yeah. be. But but if we're looking expenditure only, that shouldn't affect it at this point. And we have a lot of union contracts that either were we pretty much finished, so we kind of have some knowledge of yeah. them, right. both school That's and town. Well, so yeah, my my guess is that there's probably enough information you know, contractual information to get a, at least a picture of what it looks like. Yes. I think that's Expense that side informs only. us yep. of what's coming. I think, I think we can have a skeletal structure, if not some meat on the bones for your next meeting. I think we need to also have a uh, cautionary kind of memo to this, and that is that, you know, keep in mind the difference between business and government is that in business I don't have to give you my budget. You, you, you can be employed by me, but I do not need to give you my budget. I do not need to give it the budget. To shareholders and uh, customers. Well, you uh, do. They don't. Sure, you <laughs> do. No. <laughs> if you're a corporation, you're announcing your earnings per share projections to the to your stockholders. That's it, but you're not giving the entire budget. Well, no, but I mean, you don't, we're, you don't we're, know we're, what my estimate is. So let me finish this. <laughs> so therefore, keep in mind that when there are estimates made, particularly around contract labor um, or labor costs, it can provide a revealing hand as you're entering right. into contract negotiations. So again, it gets down to what is, uh, how will that information be shared, um, what and how will it be used, <coughs> and we need to be careful that we protect the town yep. um, in that, because that information then becomes public. But I think there are enough, and correct me if I'm wrong, but I think there are enough contracts out there that we could dilute it enough to yep. say labor expenses we, yeah, would go up X percent, yep. and that could be shared over multiple contracts different ways. But I hear, I hear what you're saying. I mean, I guess, and, and I guess I would, I would caution too that, I mean, we're going to be doing this in a couple months for next year's budget anyway. I think we're looking more at the longer vision. What's it, what, you know, getting a framework in place so that we can look maybe three to five years down the road, not that it's going to impact every single budget that we have year to year. We've got other dis issues. We're going to have more specific issues to deal with next year that we kind of already know that are there. There's going to be things we don't know already, but so, uh, you know, I, I'm, I'm the, I think the goal is not to sit down and say, you know, <coughs> we're going to go up 3.4% every, okay. every year here. It's going to be, you know, macro stuff, you know. Employment's trending this way. Uh, operations are trending this way, you know, or, or something, uh, unless I'm missing. No, no, I mean, it, it, could be, it could be as simple as, I mean, we know next year is going to be a challenge because of the funding and all the stuff that's playing through. But if we do this a couple of years out, as, as the council sits down and looks at stuff, you may find the next year out is looking pretty good. So mm -hmm. it gives you, at least informs you, you might be able to push some stuff out. Mm -hmm. so, mm -hmm. so just it's right. a better planning tool to take a look at what's coming. Right. If you know you're going to have three to four really bad years back to back, then you can kind of prepare for that. So I think it's just, it just better informs the decision making process. Good. And so. Yeah, yeah I, just, I was just thinking level of detail, right? I mean, uh, yeah, I mean, I don't think yeah. we need, I mean, it's not a specific line item, but it's this is where we think you know major expenses are going to be and trending, we're trending at and where it is and what we think that's going to be. Does that help? Clear, clear, clear as mud, right? Until <laughs> <laughs> the next meeting. No promises other than the fact that we'll give it an effort. That's a start. It's a start in the process. Um, so I guess the next topic was really to kind of um, at least start to have a conversation around debt, debt schedules and where we are and what the numbers look like. And Tom, I think you've given us three different kind of versions of things and maybe you can kind of walk us through that and what it means. Yes, um, there's a whole bunch of information that goes to support this, but for purposes of brevity and kind of presentation, we tried to really simply consolidate it for you uh, this evening and um, we're pleased to go back and provide more data if that's of, of interest. Uh, so the first schedule that we put together, and really Larissa's worked predominantly on this with our financial advisor, um, 
forecasts out uh, with great accuracy, I, I, I believe, um, current debt plus the cost of the public safety building. I guess. I just want to make sure there's only two. There's only two. There's three. Yeah. There's three. Oh, there's three. Okay. Mm -hmm. There were three. Well, the third piece was the debt management policy and the oh, okay. and the materials related to it. Um, and so we've been a bit presumptuous, but uh, expecting that this uh, capital project will be on the ballot and certainly hopefully it will pass. Uh, but it's so close and it's so present, we thought it was important to show you that model, and that's an important mm -hmm. conversation. Uh, as we're going out on the road and having conversations across the community about about that building. People uh, understandably want to know what does it mean uh, to the bottom line. Um, so you'll see we've, we're simply reporting the total debt service requirements um, out over the amortization schedule the whole term and what happens to the remaining principal balance uh, out over time. I, w I should mention as a caveat for both these, this does not program in any annual borrowing. And that's a huge point of discussion. It should be. We've done that purposely. Um, there's some choices to make. Historically, we're in the, I'll say on average, $4 million annual borrowing for various capital needs. These analyses don't include that, but we can very easily layer that in. Um, but I think there's a discussion I'd like to engage you in, and there are impacts of your decisions as to um, do we continue that trend going forward? Uh, do we? borrow less? Do we borrow none? Do we borrow more? All of those things will impact what these future debt schedules look like. Can, can you explain to me these two tables because I'm not following? Marissa, you want to take a crack? Sure. So in 4.1, okay, so this is if you took, if, if you took the total amount of principal that we're holding as, as of, um, as of November 1, because this, this is assuming um, the payment of principal that will take place in October, and you layer onto it the estimated um, public safety building bonding. Well, how much bonding did you get? 19.5 at 3.5 percent. Then the first column shows you what we would expect to have as debt service, and the second column shows you the amount of principal remaining at the end of fiscal year 18, and how that plays out with no additional bonding added to the um, to the situation. 4.2 layers in the remaining long-range facility plan projects from the town side. And no school. No, no. no school. Just shows the town. Have that yet. Um, so the, the same thing. What does, so um, for projects, PSB is public safety building. Um, IT was in the long-range facility plans for this year. Clearly that's not been something that's been discussed or even brought forward, so that's not going to be something that's going to be on November's ballot, but we have to put it somewhere. And the amortization schedules that I was amend that I was working with from Joe Katara, our, our financial agent um, advisor, showed that in this fiscal year. And okay, sorry, just can you back up a little bit. The IT, so the IT was going to be included in the public safety, correct? It was one of the considerations uh, possibly combined. In the end, it was decided not to. But the need arguably still is there, so we didn't want to have that need and the cost associated drop off the face, and we weren't sure where to put it, so we put it sooner than later. Mm -hmm. So on tape on 4.1, the 103.3 million, that includes the 19 and a half. Okay. Yep. So and that in the next one, the 105.617 includes the 21.2 million, which includes the 19 and a half and about plus the right. So um, and then you see where each year we've just kind of, and these are all estimates. This is absolutely not anything concrete or set in stone. We had to take all of the long range facility items had been given a short range, medium range, or long range need assessment. And we um, tried running it, at diff staggering them at different places. The short range was within one to five years mid-range was 5 to 12 and long range was 12 to 20 or, or something along those mm -hmm. lines. And so we have simply plugged things in in what we think is a fairly reasonable <coughs> spread to try to keep debt service at a manageable level. And again, as Tom mentioned, this does not reflect annual CIP borrowing. So right. you, what you're seeing is what it, would it look like if everything were appropriated that we now currently put into CIP and only the facilities were being bonded. Okay, and are you recluding, you're not including any, I mean, I assume these are 
uh, is there any other debt? This isn't total debt cost, or this is all total this debt? This is total debt service for the what town. we currently are holding, okay. plus if we were to add these long-range facility plan needs. Okay. Okay. Schedules, no, fee no schools, right. So, so then the question, I guess, I'd like to see a column of the debt that's retiring for that year. I mean, I could just do the yeah. principal re re you know, yeah. removal stuff, but it would be nice to see... I, I, you know, obviously the addition's key, but it's also important to know what's going off the balance sheet at the same time, I think. Yeah, we can add a call. Unless you guys disagree. Oh, no. Okay. In general, we expect to retire between seven to six, six to nine million, depending on where we're at in the schedule. Yep. But yep. Um, absolutely, that's an easy column to add in. Okay. Can, and, and, and can you do it? And I guess this is the conversation Tom wanted to have, maybe a 4.3 deck. I mean, our current practice has been, yeah, we've been doing the four to six million dollars in additional borrowing every year, and if we retire six to seven, then that makes this retirement schedule look a whole lot different. It sure does. Um, I, I think it's important that we show the impact of the of the ticket number. I mean, I think it was six million this year, wasn't it? Could we look seven. at two, four, right. and six? Two point seven. So you can see a range. This year was only two point seven. We had total. thought we borrowed. We were authorized to borrow more, but we only ended up borrowing two point seven. Right. But the average is what, Tom? I'm part. guessing it's closer to four if you uh, average okay, it out well, over time. Pick a, pick a number. <laughs> I right. was actually, I thought there was a table uh, in here which showed the borrowing, annual borrowing year over year, which is pretty much what we retire, we take out a new debt. It's close. Right? It's pretty yeah. close. So, so, so I think we end up retiring. We no, retire more than we've been no, taken out. We retire seven-ish, okay. yeah. and if we're borrowing three to four, yeah. we, we end up going down each year, which yeah. is why we expect to be at around $91 million by November 1, uh, as opposed to where we were. So it's 84, 84. 84 million by, by November, November 1. 1. We're at 91 now. Sorry. So, so maybe if you could just do a four, how about three. Two, four, and three, uh, two, four, and six million. Would that work for you? Sure. You can see what that range would sure. look like at different levels. Well, and that may also then inform the conversation Tom alluded to is, is that the right place for us to be going forward? Because we look at our debt policy, it really has some language in there about what we should put into debt versus not. And when we get there, so I, th I think it's just helpful. I think it changes these numbers a little bit. I think yeah, it's it, important. Yeah, and there are impacts. If we choose to lower the annual borrowing to $2 million. Um, that's going to impact what we can do, whether it's deferring capital projects, not doing them at all, or finding another another method to pay for it. Right. So that that's another very important conversation. Certainly my staff needs to be involved in that at the school mm -hmm. as well. Mm -hmm. um, and as we all know, try as we might, um, it's very difficult to make that transition to put these projects in the operational side of the budget. Yeah, every time we put it in. Well, and yeah, that's why... But I mean, that's why I think this longer term planning, I mean, I think we're, we're getting to a point is, you know, I, I, Chris has said it a couple times, we have, we've got some choices coming at us, and how do we make the right choices for the community, and that's going to be, the more information we have, the better picture we have, the better chance we have of figuring out what that looks like. Um, so yeah, I think if you put two, four, and six, <coughs> and then the only other, do we have any tentative numbers at all from the, have the, the school? Uh, do you know where they are in the process? Tom? Is that a good question? I don't, frankly. Uh, as I understand it, and Kate is here, perhaps she can clarify the point, but uh, as I understand it, they have a range of options um, <coughs> and a number of choices. There are impacts of those choices, financial and probably political, in terms of investing in schools or consolidating schools, and I, I'm not aware that they've made some of those policy decision, so uh, therefore we don't really have a project or a budget for that project. Now, I wouldn't want to put the business manager on the spot, so I think what we might want to do, is, especially since it's a policy issue, is take this um, and put this on the joint finance radar and have a yep. discussion right yep. there. This is, this is what we're doing on the town side yep. of things. Yep. You know, how can we fold in your data into yeah. it? We've had our plan for about 18 months. I would yep. love to, it, we can either have you adopted and move forward with the town only, but we've really been waiting to fold in the school so we have a, a full comprehensive look at what the community's needs are into the future. So uh, I'm, I'd be pleased to advance that conversation. Can I just they one really more time repeat that these are, they have not been tossed in cast right. in stone or oh, showing, yeah. no, I don't want anyone to like look at this document and be like, what, but no, community stor service storage, that's really important to me. I wanted to see that a couple <coughs> of years ago. This, the, the, not the year and the project, it's just to give an estimate of what debt could look like if yep. it's not set in stone. And maybe um, to include the school projects, understand the sensitivity of not, 
some decisions haven't been made, even if they're just really. Um, uh, yeah, you know, just labeling it project one, project two, or building one, building two, yeah. without identifying, because you know how yep. people will react um, differently than having, you know, the community yeah. center versus the town hall. Yeah. Once you start targeting a school and, you know, identifying a plan, and I know that there, there's a lot of options that they look at that's very different. I think that's a conversation well, we have with them, yeah. and if they're, I mean, I, I know that there are long-term facility plans out there, you know, whether we fold those in and just put in as a miscellaneous category or to be TBD or something, then... I mean, I, I don't think it will be. I don't want to put them in the, I mean, right. uh, you know, just to be candid, um, they've had conversations in their long range planning about whether or not they want just one elementary school or mm -hmm. whether it's about, you know, maybe uh, closing one and mm -hmm. improving the other two. And, uh, you know, so I don't want to get into kind of that uh, sensitivity because it's emotional for a lot of people. Okay. I just want to look at the numbers. But to get the numbers, someone has to make some choices. Um, well, they're guidelines, right? Sure, These yeah. are guidelines. The school will give us guidelines, and together we'll have a town guideline. Right. <coughs> okay. So, and as we um, run these other schedules for you, um, you know, we can get, again, as Larissa says, there's some assumptions as to which project comes exactly at which year. Uh, they do fall within the ranges that the, that the uh, facilities guide suggests, but there's flexibility there. But um, we can be, we can further refine these. Uh, we did consult with our financial advisor initially, and we've kind of worked with it from there. But we can go back to them once we have a uh, better clarity as to what we actually want to model. And this is this conversation has been helpful. Anything else? Yeah. Yeah. Good. <coughs> I guess the only other thing is we have the, the, the other thing on the agenda was to talk a little bit about the, the budget, sort of debrief, what worked, what didn't work, improvements. I don't know if we want to do that tonight or wait until this closes out and have some time and distance Perhaps to reflect premature. on what's that? Perhaps premature? Yeah, yeah. I hope not. Yeah. 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 yeah, I'm happy to have one. Okay. Yeah. Um, but I think we have tentatively our next meeting date is September 14th. Does that work for everybody? Uh, Yes. Oh, I promised those models by uh, the next meeting. That's is that right around the corner. I think so. I think it is. It's a Thursday night. I, I, am, Thursday. I, I am. I have yeah. a library. I think I have a library board. The All Board think. Summit is that night. Uh, you may have okay. received an invite. Um, yeah. I just, yeah. Yeah. I'm yeah. actually out of town on business too, so I'm not right. not available. We'll reschedule it later yeah. right now. Can I go back to budget debrief? Um, I, I would table that. I didn't hear a motion or a second or a vote. So. <laughs> Um, I would really like to have that conversation um, joint with the school board. Mm -hmm. Come, come to that. It was a joint process. It yep. needs to be a joint conversation. Okay. Do we have anything on the docket with them coming up for joint? Sounds like there's a couple of things we probably should. Mm -hmm. We might want to do that sooner rather than later. I don't know. Yeah, Jody is open. Okay. Yeah, so we could get a some commentary from them on the, where they are on their long range facility plan and then yeah. this general okay. conversation from the stuff we're doing yeah. and why we're doing it. Yeah. Will you reach out to your counterpart? Yeah. Okay. I'll reach out to Jeff. So okay. just so I'm clear, September 14th is, is off the table. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Just for, uh, to be put into the minutes and for public record, even though it's not on here for, um, I did want to advise as chair of the council, I have reached out to the school board to have a joint workshop of both bodies to talk about the ad hoc committee and I have, um, Kelly was, uh, um, what's the polling or trying to get in yeah. touch with each of the, her members to see what their availability had been. Keep in mind, we may need to do it on a non-council evening night um, to accommodate their schedule. They're typically at our meetings and accommodate us, so yeah. um, keep that kind of in mind because um, we have a very short window to some extent with the long weekend because um, that issue has been tabled until the September 20th meeting. So uh, depending on schedules and the school just starting, uh, we need to be sensitive to their schedule as well. So okay. I just wanted you to be aware. Thank you. Any public comment from anybody at this point? Hi, is this on? Yeah, okay. I have two public comments. Um, one is on the dashboard, because I did dashboards in since I, my whole career was finance. Um, I think a couple of things added 
to uh, the columns if you had targets, and they could be targets based on your policies or, or if you come up with targets, so that the number means something because it's relating to something. And then I would put all last year's fiscal year end numbers. So again, you can, rather than just an arrow that says up or down, you have a target, you have what, where you were last year, and then you have this year's. And it, and it gives the reader a better understanding of what they're looking at. I would definitely not use per capita because you have to think about cost benefit of what you're doing here. And it's a lot of cost of time and effort to do the capita. And I don't know that there's a lot of benefit at the end of it. Um, the, the one I liked the best was the debt to the full valuation. I thought that was probably um, the most reasonable um, look. But I'd also like to see maybe the total expense percent to total revenue. Like are we spending basically 89 or 95 percent of the revenues and then some of it goes to fund balance or some of it goes to capital, but what is that? Yeah, I have no idea. So operating expenditure as a percentage? Yeah, gross expense to gross uh, revenue. Yeah. So, so you would see kind of that where, you know, what that is and what's going to fund balance or reserves. And um, my other comment, so that was on the dashboard. My other comment is about on the borrowing. About, I don't know, three years ago, four years ago, I had written in to the council, whoever was on council at the time, and Tom, that if you funded depreciation, if you actually funded it, because it's usually a non-cash expense, but if you actually set up an account for funded depreciation, and if depreciation was, you know, 10000 that month, you put 10000 in the fund. At the end of the asset's life, you would have the equivalent of the money that that asset originally cost. Now, costs go up, but say it was a fire truck, and I don't know how much they are, but say it's $100,000, and you've set, now set aside 100000 and now maybe it's 120. You only have to borrow 20. Plus, if you've gotten decent interest over that 10 years or however long the fire truck lasts, you might actually have enough to replace it without borrowing. So when you think about borrowing, you have to think about what are you borrowing for. And if it's capital assets, you should be actually funding the depreciation. And I wouldn't, you can't go back and do it. But for new items, as you purchase them, start funding them so that you start to build that up. And at some point, you end up with enough funding to replace your, your items. If not 100%, you can replace them at 80% and it reduces your borrowing. So your debt service goes down, and you're actually earning interest on the money you're setting aside instead of spending interest on the debt. And I've looked it up, and in GAP, you can, I mean, in the GASB, you can do this. Great. I'm Sue Hamill, uh, 3 Bay Street. Um, as far as the dashboard, I do, as much as certain people don't really like the debt per capita, I think it's a figure that people, the general public likes it. They understand it, and they do look at it. And I do understand that we have a large commercial base, but other towns have a large commercial, some other towns, not every town, some other towns also have a large commercial base. So I think there is a value in, in using the debt per capita. Um, and, I, and publishing it. Uh, people are going to look at it. And if you don't put it together and calculate it, the other people will be doing that. As far as fiscal planning, it sounds like um, as much as certain people are kind of resistant to trying, trying to forecast and look ahead, um, next year is a good example of where it would have been great this year to have a better idea of where we're going to be next year um, if we had done some forecasting because we do know that the 2.1 million that the schools used kind of to fill a gap is now gone. And you do have the contract, so you know what the level services budget will look like, what, what will be the cost for that. And then if you were to add in the debt service if the public safety building passes, and you know that it, you're borrowing $20 million and over 30 years you're paying back about a million dollars a year on that, what impact that has to the tax rate. So you would know that already, just keeping everything else the same and, and adding in the public safety building, that you might be looking at 
a tax increase of over 3.5 percent, right off, you know, with no nothing else changes. And I, I think it's important to at least know that, be aware of that as you're working on this year's budget or as you, you know, le everything leading up to this year's budget. And I, I, the other thing, um, the revaluation is so desperately needed. Um, I know that it was on a ballot a few years, maybe five years ago, quite a while ago. But it's so, we really need to get this done. And I know that there are uh, other towns will hire an outside contractor to come in and do the whole thing. Um, there's a, the state has I, I, a lot of resources that um, I know you can access and see what have other towns done. It's all listed right there. Who did they use? How much did it cost? And when was it done? Um, the fourth thing, the adopting the long-range capital plan. I know we've, we've been looking at the draft. It's been floating around. But I don't remember really the council ever really talking about all the items that are on there. Um, I know that the staff has put together what are the short range, mid range, and long term needs. But um, I think it's important to have an open discussion and have some community involvement. Um, I'm looking at the public safety building. We know that that building is really needed. Um, and we've waited a long time for it. But for, for me, it's kind of like putting a roof on your house. You just have to do it, and it stinks. You don't want to have to spend the money. No one's going to say, great new roof, you know. You, you don't really get to enjoy it. And we need a community center and a senior center. And we've been talking about it, and I see on that um, long-range capital plan, it's in there for 2032. And my goodness. This is, I mean, it would be great PR. Great PR. People might actually step up and want to pay for it um, and not really resist paying for it. And last thing, comprehensive plan. I'm hoping that that comprehensive plan will show that this town really needs a community center, that it will bring people together and... Um, you know, the com a community center could do so much for this town um, in many, many ways. And we've had, it's been a pretty um, tough year. Uh, everyone knows what I'm talking about. And, but it would be, I do think that it would be something that would, that would bring the community together. Thanks. Larry Hartwell, Nine Puritan Drive. I saw a news item today about some votes, some ballots that had disappeared, reappeared, what have you. Um, I wondered if the council or the town manager would like to speak to that, or is that something that's going to come up next week at the town council meeting, or none of the above? Can I speak? Yeah. I don't think it's an appropriate conversation for the finance committee. But as chairman of the council, um, it is going to be a conversation that will be um, had because a, um, an amended vote on um, accepting the outcomes has to occur, so that will be on the next, on the next week's agenda. And I'll answer anybody's questions after the meeting. I'll be happy to answer anyone's questions about it. Any other questions, anybody? Motion to adjourn. So moved. Second. All in favor? Thank you.